Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. In the last message in this last day series, we identified who this beast referred to in the book of Revelation chapter 13 is. We identified the leopard, I mean the lion, the bear, and the leopard kingdoms. If you missed that particular message, Check on the archives. If it's not there, it will be there in the future. That particular message. It's the first message on the beast, chapter 13. And we identified the lion, the bear, and the leopard kingdoms. We were in the book, like I said, just before the close of that message in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Let's just read it again. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having said seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beach which I saw, and the beast, excuse me, not the beach, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power, and his seat, and his seat, and great authority. And I pointed out authority given by permission. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, Or slain to death is an okay translation. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. Let's continue reading the rest of the verses. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying who is like unto the beast. Who is able to make war with him. And there was given unto him, literally, it should read, and there was given unto it a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, or to make war for forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and then that and them that dwell in heaven and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given unto him all the kindreds tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if any man have an ear let him hear he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints, or the endurance and the faith of the saints. What verse 10 is saying, what comes around goes around. You're going to kill by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. You're going to leave people into captivity, you're going to be into captivity led into captivity. What comes around goes around. Now, let's go back to some of these verses. I pointed out the last time I was preaching in this series that God never changed the identity of the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Beast kingdoms. He never changed their identity throughout Scripture, throughout His Word, leading up to the book of Revelation. You can't find it anywhere where God, in any book, not that it's listed in all the books, but in any book, 
the Lord changing the identity of these beasts. Really, when all said and done with any beasts, and there's eight of them, from the beginning of time to the end of time, is history that we have it, we, have, we, we can see for ourselves that's been recorded in both in the Old and New Testament. One of these days I'll read to you how we got the dating procedures that we follow that lined up in all the kings, especially the first kings and second kings, the kings of Judah and Israel, by an outside source, not in Israel, but the Assyrian Empire. But that's for another day. These beast kingdoms, the leopard, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, throughout God's word, including the book of Revelation, has never been changed. Now, modern prophetic teachers like to change the identity and they have listed chapter 13 as the Antichrist chapter. It's not. And I've already covered about the Antichrist in a general way, why it isn't Antichrist that's named here. It's a leopard, bear, and a lion. Or lion, lion meaning Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, the bear, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the leopard, the Grecian Empire. Alexander the Great Empire. And then broken up to four different rulers when he died suddenly at a young age, divided between four generals, the Alexandrian Empire or the Grecian Empire. Nowhere in God's word I can't say it often enough to allow it to sink into your minds. We have no instruction and we're not given any instruction anywhere in God's book to change these identities of these beasts. Anywhere. So when we get to the book of Revelation and Revelation chapter 13, the question is, why do they change it? Well, I've been answering that for months now. So it can fit their Christian science fiction made-up doctrines, which are nothing more than fantasy. Because they couldn't explain it, because the time was not yet for it to be explained, because certain things, when these doctrines, doctrines were being developed, have not happened yet to point to those times and to look back when the times actually started. For instance, time, times and a half, 42 months, the time of the Gentiles, and all the things we've covered so far. We had to see the fulfillment of those to get an idea what God was talking about, what he was referring to in his word. Even Daniel didn't know. I've covered that. I've covered that. Now, if you read this beast, the beast here listed in verse 2 in chapter 13 in the book of Revelation, this beast, by its very description of all these different empires and beasts, are wrapped up into one beast now. One ugly beast. One ugly empire. The lion beast is not a separate empire coexisting with the bear and the lion. They're all unified as one empire. One ugly beast looking empire. So, once you accept that, and you realize that God's never changed the identities of these beasts, and now three of Daniel's four beasts are now made into one ugly-looking beast, we have to look at what unifies 
these three beasts, not in the future, even though we can in the present and the future, and you'll see why when I'm done with it, but more importantly, we can see where these three beasts came, became unified and start acting as one beast, the lion, bear, and leopard, at a certain point in history, at a certain point in time. And if we look back, I'll just jump ahead and then I'll go back. There's one unifying factor that came along in history that gave it a foundation controlled by Satan through a man, as I covered last week, named Muhammad, that developed the foundation, the basic structure of a new religion, a religion which not only control all religious aspects of a man's life, but also controls the governmental policies a man and a woman should be governed by. Muhammad provided that. I haven't got into yet what Muhammad provided and how he was able to con so many people to become converts through miracles, through the unbelievable, it seemed like supernatural events that took place around his life. But that's still yet to come. Muhammad uni was a unifi unifying factor. Islam gave it a governing identity to carry out its mission. And when I say its mission, the leopard, the lion, and the bear is a mission controlled by the dragon. Islam started by its prophet Muhammad. In history and presently, it's still going on today. This three beast, beast kingdom is carrying out its purposes. Now, this three beast kingdom, and I've covered some of this the last time I was on the beast, controls a geographical area Iraq, Iran, Lebanon. Syria, it also controls external geographical areas such as Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, but that's another story. There's prophecies that have to be look, we have to look at totally separately from this particular beast teaching. In other areas like Kuwait, Jordan, you can go and look at a, a global map, an atlas, and you can see the expansion both east and west for the major part of its expansion with a little bit north and south, how Islam has spread. Most of northern Africa, some central Africa, especially on the uh, Suez Canal side. And now it's growing in popularity on the Atlantic side, countries as Nigeria. You can't even go to some northern areas of Nigeria and not be a Muslim. I've had stories after stories emailed to me over the last few years how churches have burned down and they have killed people. Same goes with in India. The spread of Islam goes all the way to the Indonesia islands. Indonesian islands. They're working in now into Europe in these last days. But for the purposes of how we are to perceive prophecy, we have to stay in a geographical area that John, when he was given these scriptures for our benefit by Jesus himself, was referring to, and that was a then known world. 
where the leopard, the bear, and the lion, or the lion, the bear, and the leopard, in the past, conquered, controlled, and governed with their particular leadership and how looking forward into the future they would become unified not as separate beasts anymore controlling separate countries but they become unified by a common denominator and that common denominator is Islam Islam and I believe, which I will probably get to to the very end of this series, what countries will align themselves in a cohesive way with the lion, the bear, and the leopard to fulfill all of prophecy that's given to us considering these beasts and the horns their power is distributed by. But that's jumping the gun. I'm not going to get there yet. So let's focus on the beast tonight. Like I said, all these countries have a common denominator, and that is Islam. But they also have another common denominator. They hate. They hate with a passion. And they want, want to destroy with a passion USA. The USA, or the United States of America, England, anywhere the lost tribes settled, and where most of their hatred is directed or focused on, Israel. Israel and the Jews. So they have two common denominators. Actually, three. They're all these bees combined into one are all controlled by the dragon. Number two, the, they are unified by Islam. And that will become more clear to you in the weeks ahead as I laid that foundation down. And number three, they hate and want to destroy Everything that came out of Israel, far as the dispersions go, of the northern kingdom and what's there now, Israel and the Jews. That's what Satan wants to destroy. They are the enemies. Don't be fooled by silly media or silly authors think that we can somehow all reason together and somewhere down the road have an everlasting peace. They are the enemies of the West and that will not change, folks. It just won't change. Oh, you might see some glimmers of hope here and there, but deep down inside, Islam will always remain as an enemy of the West and Israel. So the question is why? Why? Why such hatred? Well, you don't have to go very far. And you have the answer in Scripture. Look who empowers these countries. Look who empowers these countries. The dragon, verse 2. And the dragon gave, literally, it, it's his power, his dynamic power and force, and his seat. And great authority, authority given by permission. Whose permission? Of course, God allowing it to happen, but Satan handing the reins over to this beast, this Islamic and empirical beast. Controlled by Satan to do its bidding not just in these last days, but, a, but through a certain time in history. Satan empowers these countries. Their God, Allah, 
for Allah is not the same Lord, not the same God that we worship and serve. I'm sorry, we just cannot all get along. I don't recognize their God. That was Israel's problem in the Old Testament. And thank God, at least in this one incident, they learn never to put their trust or to follow or worship any false idols after the last destruction in the Old Testament. That's one thing they had not been guilty of, in a sense, the way and the way they were worshiping in the old. Now we all, as individuals, worship all kinds of things. We set up false idols that we don't even know about or recognize. Money is one of them. Material things. I could give you a list a mile long. I'm just as guilty as you. But I'm a work in progress, molded by Jesus Christ. And he hasn't stopped molding me yet. He hasn't stopped molding you yet. So he's working on us as he deals with us with our particular personal problems and personal changes that need to be made. But far as worshiping other idols and other gods, I'm sorry. I can never get along with the Islamic Muslim. that doesn't respect the God that I serve. They deny that Jesus Christ was the Son of the living God. They made that clear in the Dome of the Rock. It's inscribed in that temple or mosque, excuse me, it's inscribed on the wall. I'm not saying to hate all Muslims. I preach to it. This message goes directly straight into all these countries. In a sense, I put myself at risk. Because the last thing they want to hear is they're the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And they're serving a false god, a man-made god. Can I get along with them? Sure, I can get along with them. But I'll never get along with them acknowledging that their god is some or their god is a god that needs to be respected also. I don't care if you're a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Hare Krishna, or whatever. If you don't recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, the only begotten Son of the Father, and through Him, and only Him, there's eternal life, then you're lost. And I'm not going to sit here and say, well, I'll pray for you, and ho hopefully whatever God you serve can work it out with you. When I know it won't. Especially after you hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. I can't make the exception if you never heard the gospel. But once you heard the gospel, sorry. We have nothing in common. Except maybe we have the same kind of skin, the same kind of blood In the same planet that we share, but we don't share the same God. In the same token, I'm the first one to say, let's preach, and let's try to show them what Jesus Christ truly was and is and forever will be, what he's been to us. Let's try to bring him that eternal hope. Their God is not the same God that we serve and worship. Their God is man-made by their prophet, their false prophet, Muhammad. 
a con man that created a false god and conned many individuals to start a religion. So having all that information and all the information that we've covered up to this point, I think this is either the, I don't even know, they're in the 20s somewhere as far as messages go. Before we get any further, because you can't, because you read about the 42 months in, this, in these verses in Revelation 13, so, even though you have the information, let us, re let us review a little bit what we already covered in this series. To see when this beast was going to be allowed to have this kind of power, to be in power. Remember, this beast controls Jerusalem as we already covered all the way to 1967. And it still exists today, but doesn't have control of the holy city. And that's key in understanding prophetic dates. So having all this information, let's go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. Well, let's just read verse 1 and 2. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without, or literally outside, the temple leave out. We've covered these scriptures before. And measured it not. And I cover, and I cover why they shouldn't be measured. For it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot, or in control literally, underfoot, Forty-two months. Forty-two months. Now, what is forty-two months? Well, if you go back in your notes, or if you remember off the top of your head, forty-two months was 1,278 years, or 1,278.34 years. Well, how do you get that figure? Well, you take a soul year, which is 365, 0 0.24, 365.24 divided by 12 will get you to the figure of 30.44 or 30.44 days. And that's how we came up with 1,278, I think it's 0.5 years. Capiche? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you remember what's already been taught. That's why when the messages come available in a written format, you should keep reading them and keep reading them till you have this down where you could recite it if you had to. It's that important to know. And that reminds me, by the way, we just sent out the second written sermon in this series. And, and I got very few. I was amazed. I got very few people writing me and saying, oh, I got it, thanks. And I can review it again. And now have it in front of me to go back, write my notes on it, or do whatever you want to do with it. It comes hard. And it's taken for granted. And that is disappointing. You're spoiled babies. Let's continue before I get sidetracked. 1278.34 years. Well, we took that date. And we took the date of the Dome of the Rock when it was built in 688 A.D. And whether you go backward or forward, if you go forward, you come to the year 1967. You go backwards, you come to 688 A.D. What happened in 1967? It 
Israel gained control of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the holy city, in 1967. And that's equivalent to 42 months. Islam had authority over Jerusalem to blasphemy God's tabernacle for 42 months. Revelation 11 and Revelation 13 are parallel prophecies. They're not separate prophecies. Sorry, they're just not. The 42 months in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, and in Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, are parallel prophecies. Don't make up a story to fit some other kind of fantasy story to make false doctrines fit. They are identifying who was going to rule Jerusalem from 688 A.D. to 1967. It also identifies, even though we didn't cover it this way, who would have authority over Israel with one interruption, by the way, which we'll get to, which is in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 13, the two horns like a lamb. And oh boy, the, most Christians have fantasized over that particular verses. Verse in the following verses. Silly fantasy stories that doesn't line up, it's not verifiable in God's word. I'm laying you down verifiable facts, folks. Taking the heat for it, this ministry, is sure taking the blows for it. But what else should we do? Just be quiet? Or recognize that the end of all things is knocking at the door and most everyone that's listening to me tonight is taking that for granted. You don't think. And you're falsely being preached a different doctrine. And you don't think you have a responsibility to, under, to understand the last days. That's why when you get to the end of the book, basically what Christ is saying, woe to the person that adds to it or takes away from it that's not part of his book. When the time came available to be understood. And just about everyone listening to me is taking it for granted and take it so casually with the dumbest attitude a Christian could ever have. Well, I'm going to get to heaven anyway. It doesn't really matter when it happens. It tells me something about you. And it told me something years ago and I came convicted by it. You don't care when it's going to happen because you don't care all the ones that will be left behind without any eternal hope. I'm telling you right now, you're not going to be raptured. I'm jumping ahead of the story and then there's going to be a great tribulation. It's not going to happen. And I'll prove it in God's word. And some 144,000 are going to be left here to preach to the last seven years or three and a half years, whatever your silly doctrine preaches. It's not going to happen. Most people don't even understand. I bet there's not a single person listening to me tonight that even has a clue what that 144,000 is. You've taken it for granted, granted. And it demonstrates an attitude that Christ needs to work in your life to increase, to increase the concern about how many are going to be conned. How many Satan will still have a hold of that won't have the breath of eternity and the hope of eternity 
because there's been too many casual Christians not recognizing the time is at hand. Christ is knocking the door to open up heaven's door and a new era of eons of time will take place when all things are reset and start all over again without Satan and his minions to do his damage. I'm sorry. You think you do, but you don't. You don't have the concern of the Great Commission. Your concern is still is all about you and what your day consists of. And not recognizing even it means you only could dedicate five minutes of a day because you've been overburdened with circumstances from Satan. Not a day is going to go by without a dedication of some time to fulfill the Great Commission. I'm so sick of the man. I wish I could say what I want to say, but I can't. The pansy Christians that don't like the fire and brimstone mentality of preaching. How else? How else? When the age of the church is over anyway, and just a remnant of the church is making it to the extreme end, or the very end, are going to get the attention of a bunch of hard-headed, excuse-making, ex explaining with anything from philosophy to science why God does not exist. How else are you going to get their attention? Well, just keep preaching the message of grace. Oh, I agree with that. After you knock them over, preach all the grace that they need so they can recognize why they need it. Because obviously a lot of grace has been preached, believe me, the last hundred years and very few takers. The lukewarm church destroyed the church. The very last church in the book of Revelation in the earlier chapters. The lukewarm church destroyed the church. But God still wants remnants that recognize they're the out-called ones all the way, way to the very last moment of time until the end to pluck from Satan's grip ones that can hear the truth and respond to it. But it's going to take soldiers of Jesus Christ with a passion, with a passion to carry it out. I pray that God does send people with passion to this ministry that recognize that we only have begun in a sh short amount of time to lay out the last warning of time why they need to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. As the days of Noah, the gospel record says, Show how these last days be. Everybody busy doing their own thing, Christian or non-Christian, doesn't matter. But not heeding the warning when the warning has been made clear to you. I won't rest until I have as many as I ha can in the ministerial word, world, heeding that warning.
And your passion should be the same in the capacity that God's called you to support that great commission. Jesus saves, and he's coming very soon. Sooner than most Christians even think. Israel regained control of Jerusalem. The holy city of God in 1967. 42 months. As we are told in scripture. In several locations. I already preached in the 42 months. Go listen to it. I know that's already in the archives. If you missed it. Islam had authority over Jerusalem to blasphemy, as I said already. God's tabernacle for 42 months. Revelation 11, Revelation 13. Concerning the 42 months are parallel prophecies. So we know when this beast would have control and power over both Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem. They still are there, believe me, not in the holy city. Well, their mosque is, but they don't have control of it. But they're still an active beast as I speak. And Satan has other plans for them, which is still yet to come. But this identifies, without a doubt, who was going to rule Jerusalem in 1968 to 1967. This is not in this book, Revelation 13, a future Antichrist, folks. It's a beast. And we know when it's going to be, when it, its power would come into existence to control Israel and Jerusalem. That's the ultimate goal of this beast. This lion, bear, bear and leopard beast was and is still today the Islamic nations and empire that now stands against the West, and more importantly, Israel. Let's just read these scriptures. So I give you, let's just read these scriptures. I add a little footnotes in there. Revelation 13, 3. And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death. Let's just start with that verse. And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death. And I will cover that death here in a few moments. So I'll get back to that. It's about Muslim expansion into Europe and how it was destroyed. It wanted world conquest. And not just any part of the world. It wanted to go where the lost tribes. Its ultimate destiny was to get to England. That's a matter of history. You don't have to believe me or take my word for it. Go do your own study on it. Why? Because that's where the remnants of the lost trial tribes went. And that's where they settled. And eventually, traveling across the Atlantic, the United States of America became, as I said, and I've already covered, Ephraim. And his deadly wound was healed. When was it that deadly wound healed? I'm telling you right now, we'll come back to this, but right on the side of your margin there, after World War II, the Western nations, out of all people, but that's what we're known for, Western nations sent a major portion of their liquid assets, of their liquid assets and their liquid capital into the Middle East. Which allowed the Muslim nations to rebuild. That's a matter of history too, which is not the subject matter tonight, but that's, you could check, go to the library, check it out. It's 
continue. And all the world. Remember, Bible prophecy is ethnographic. The whole world here in this verse refers to the world that John knew. The world that John existed in. John's known world. Not a global worldwide event. That's where most prophecy teachers go wrong. The Lord is not telling John that this is going to be a, an event that affects Australia, even the Americas, China. No. The then known world. More specifically, the Middle East as we know it today. Let's go back. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they sure are, aren't they? And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. <coughs> and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now we haven't covered that part of history. But from 632 all the way to the present time, who has been able in that world to overcome this beast? No one. Oh, there will be some infighting amongst them themselves amongst the countries Islamic belief systems have penetrated just like the United States had a civil war brother against brother just like the revolutionary war England against the colonies that wanted independence from England it's nothing new to f have infighting amongst an empirical system. But for the most part, throughout the Middle East and the areas controlled by the leopard, bear, and lion, no one could come against it. No one except in 1948 and 1967 Israel so who is able to make war with them during the first, G first jihad, which we'll cover tonight? The Muslims were victorious, and they trampled on anything they came on and came across. They plundered, they conquered, they raped, they killed, they took control over, and they were victorious. Not only other brethren that might have not been Islamic nations, and most of the part at the beginning stage of the Islamic nation, the, the spreading of Islamic ideas and systems and religion, for the most part they were not Islamic. But they couldn't resist it. They couldn't resist this beast. And they became what they couldn't resist. And they even had victories over the Christians and the Jews in those earlier periods. And the Middle East. And they traveled westward across northern Africa. And then to the most eastern part of the Roman Empire through the Iberian Peninsula. Revelation 13.5 and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. This is the Muslim domination of Jerusalem from 688 to 1967. 42 months of day equals years as we already covered. And he, who is he? The lion bearing leopard beast. The Muslim states opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blasphemy his name and his tabernacle. How they do that? Wasn't the Muslims that build a memorial to Muhammad? 
Isn't there an abomination desolation called the Dome of the Rock? And a stone throw away the Alusk Mosque on that Tibble Mount? Sure, it's in the side of the Gentile area. Even though they thought they built it over the temple where the Holy Temple used to sit. Where the Holy Holies, Holy of Holies used to sit in that temple. All there there now is the Tome of the Tablets. A little covering memorial in a wide open space where that holy temple where the holy temple used to exist but nevertheless they built a memorial to muhammad and them that dwell in heaven well what does that mean you go to ephesians 2 i don't have time right now and we are raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in christ jesus so even though physically we're not there, we are represented there by Christ himself. So our flesh is here, but what we are experiencing and what we go through and how we communicate through Jesus is there. Sometimes it's hard to imagine, but in faith we have to fade that. So when you read these verses, there was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power is given to him to continue 40 and 2 months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God who blasphemed his name in his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him, who, or it, literally, the lion, bear, and leopard, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The first jihad, overwhelmed. This is a part of history. There's not a single Christian that's listening tonight should not be interested in learning this part of history. I don't know how much I can cover it in this series, or else the series will take. God would have to extend the time of the end for me to conclude this series. Now, I'm not trying to be funny there. That's just how much history there is on it. And it was given unto him, the lion, bear, and leopard, to make war with the saints and overcome them. The first jihad overwhelmed the Coptic church, folks. That's a matter of history which at that time the Coptic Church covered all the Middle East, including northern Africa. It conquered it. In power, and eventually it spread all the way to India. And far west as to Spain. And power was given over all the kindreds and tongues and nations. Not all the kindreds and tongues and nations of the global world, but the geographical area that John is referring to here. It's ethnographic. Remember that. And in primary, it's describing countries that surround the Holy Land. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name are not written in the book of life, the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. If any man hear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. During that first jihad, folks, the area controlled, like I said, by the Coptic church went into captivity. It went into captivity. And that also included the Holy Land and Jerusalem. He that killed with the sword must be killed with the sword. How did that happen? Well, the Muslims got cocky and being controlled by Satan. And Satan knew where those lost tribes, the remnants of the northern part of Israel, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, not the southern kingdom of Judah, Benjamin, and the Levites, but the northern tribes, which include Joseph and all the promise that flowed through Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons, he knew where they were, and he was making a beeline towards that area. He that killed with the sword must be killed with the sword. The Muslims' army, the Middle Ages, were defeated. And I've covered this before in a series I started called Antichrist, but I left that series because I wanted to do this series, which would cover so much more. But I already covered. Where was he defeated? 
What comes around goes around. Where was he defeated? At the Battle of Tours and later Vienna. But Vienna didn't have the same significance because that was not in the direction where the lost tribes went. Because if Satan could conquer those lost tribes, he knew that he could di dictate history and God would have to change his plans. How the next, the next 13 to 1400 years of history would had to would have to be altered because we would have no countries that we have today no countries whatsoever that's just a given folks that's just a given the here is the patience back to the verse here is the patience and the faith of the saints The leopard, the bear, and the lion in these verses are Satan's tool of a physical kingdom but controlled by a spiritual kingdom that controls the Middle East. The Muslims who control the Holy Land, which also included Jerusalem, were at risk of forever being destroyed. But God had other plans. God had other plans. And what are those other plans? Well, here in Revelation chapter 13, we have three beasts. But one of these beasts, if you look in verse 3, and one of its heads, excuse me, and one of the, and I saw one of its heads, and it was where as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Now, how was it wounded to death? Where was it wounded to death? And when? I already told how, how it was healed. After World War II, the financial power was given to them to rebuild. And boy, have they. You have to remember in history, there's more than just four beasts. We see in Daniel, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrible beast, which was Rome, the Roman Empire. But there was eight altogether. Just write these down now, and we'll go to the verse. You had Egypt, the first beast. You had the Assyrian Empire, the second you had the Babylonian Empire, the third. You had the Medo-Persian Medo Empire, the fourth. You had the Grecian Empire, the fifth. You had Rome, the sixth empire. Now, I'm telling you tonight, there was a first jihad empire of the Islamic empire as a seventh beast, and you're going to have a second jihad of the Islamic Empire which is part of that lion bearing leopard beast the terrible beast and I referred to already in the I think it was the last message or the message before that the terrible beast was slain and it was never going to be resurrected again there's no one scripture that says it does even though nine-tenths of all the prophecy teaching out there says it's gonna be a reconstructed Roman Empire a European Union whatever you want to call it that's going to be the this terrible beast at the end where Antichrist comes out of. No, it's not. Those, those authors and the books they have written is only have one practical use in my opinion. And that is to start your fire in the fireplace. It's false doctrine. It's not true. The terrible beast, the fourth beast of Daniel, is not part of the body of the lion, bear, and leopard beast of Revelation 13. It's not part of the seventh or eighth beast. And this first jihad, the seventh beast, was only going to be able 
to have a short space of short space. And when we go back to Daniel 12, we'll even know how long that space was. Well, let's just go to Revelation 17 before I go any further. Revelation 17. I'm not going to read you the whole chapter, but I'll get back to that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth and all that that leads up to these verses. But let's just pick it up with verse 7. And the angel said, I'm in 17, 7. Revelation 17, 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast, verse 8 now, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Was and is not. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind I'm sorry, you're going to have, to have the mind of Christ to understand this. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. No, not seven mountains of Rome. Sorry, bad theology. Know where you can back that up. The seven heads are seven mountains of which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. What five? Egypt. Assyrian Empire, Babylon and its empire, Medo-Persian Empire, and the Grecian Empire. Those are the five. Five are fallen, and one is. Who is the one in John's time? The Roman Empire. So that's the sixth beast. The other, not Anne, the other is not yet come. So the seventh beast has not arrived yet when John wrote this. It's still a future event. A future beast. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. I'll come back to that. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. So the beast that still hasn't come is going to be the eighth beast and is also the seventh beast. Still coming from one beast, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Got that? And the beast that was, the one that would come after the Roman Empire, remember the Roman Empire fell approximately 476 AD, give or take. Shortly after that, what happened? What happened? Muhammad comes on the scene. His Islam is established. What happened? So, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as king one hour with the beast. Well, that will be interesting when we get there. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Unto the beast. Well, we know it needs to continue a short space. Right? Now, I'm just going to do some calculations here real quick. Who is this seventh beast? I've told you it's Islam. It's Islam. The first jihad. Controlled by the beast, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And when it was slain, 
was a very important time in history. A very important time in history. Because if it wasn't going to be slain, if it was not slain, we would have a whole different type of history to read in the history books now. You might be worshiping Allah right now. I want you to think about that long and hard. I guarantee you would not be worshiping Jesus Christ. You'd be worshiping Allah. So what happened? Well, first, but first, let's look when it happened. The only way we can figure that out is by looking at Daniel 12. Go back to Daniel 12. We pick up in verse 11 in Daniel 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifices shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, which we already covered, go back to the previous teachings, was 688 A.D. when the Dome of the Rock was built. The starting of the construction of the Dome of the Rock began in 688 A.D. and concluded in 691 A.D., followed by the Alusk. And from that time, the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up. There shall be 1,290 days. And we've already done those calculations, and I don't have time to review it now. It took us all the way to 688 A.D. Those of you who remember those calculations, this is still like fresh in your memory, bank, so you understand where I'm going with this. Blessed is he. Then it's a strange, and no matter where you go and what you read, they don't have an expl explanation for it. If they do, it's a really, really weak explanation, folks. It's almost laughable. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. What? You could also read it. Fortunate is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty five days. A thousand three hundred and thirty five days. Why is that important? And the only basis we have to calculate this on is using the same starting date as we did to get to 688 A.D. You take 688 A.D., you subtract the 1290 days, you have a starting date. You take that same starting date, now add the 1,335 days moved forward or backward, if you want to take it from the A.D. date, which you come to a date of 732 A.D. 732 A.D. Well, since you have to use the Old Testament principle of calculation of what a prophetic year adds up to be, if you remember the teaching, hopefully you do, or else you're lost right now. You take the calculation of 1335 we have here in verse 12 times 0.9857 to get to the prophetic year and using the prophetic year language conversion calculation, it comes out to 1,315.9 years now remember the starting date 583 bc go forward and then go backward it pinpoints a date of 732.9 a.d 732.9 a.d that's the only possible explanation here because of the previous verse verse 11 gives us a time period when the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices was taken away. When the last remnant was carted off to Babylon in 583 B.C. You started that calculation. You move forward 1290. You know where you get. The abomination of desolation. You take the same starting date because we're not told to use any other starting date after this verse. Except for the previous verse, verse 11. You move it forward. You get to 732.9 A.D. Period. No other explanation needed because it's already been given. No fantasy stories need to be developed because it's already been given. No Christian science fiction doctors need to be falsely preached because we have the explanation. 
because now we know the details, because we have seen prophecies fulfilled both in 1948 and 1967. So what happened? What happened? I've already covered this, and some of this is not new to you any longer, but what I'm about ready, about ready to read to you is going to be new, and I'll try to do this quickly. What happened? And why is 732 A.D. so important? Because the Battle of Tours... The Battle of Tours took place. It was a crucial battle. It put a stop to the seventh beast, the first jihad. Not the seventh beast. The, the first jihad, which is part of the seven of the total eight. Back to Revelation. So I want, I want you to be clear on this. Without a doubt... And if you have the mind of wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains in which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet to come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. From 688. From 688 to 732 is how many years? Do the calculation. Well, let's me while you're doing that, let me read you about the Battle of Tours. Let me just read it, read it to you here quickly. Very important history that everyone should know. You probably wouldn't be a Christian today. You probably wouldn't be a Christian today if this battle didn't take place. But yet, I'm sure before I even said anything about this battle, not a single Christian listened to me today, or probably non-Christian, or when I did first refer to this story in the past, ever even heard of this battle. That's a shame. I fought the pastors, teachers, professors, that teach God's word. Not so much the congregation members sitting in the pulpit, I mean sitting in the pews. Not the students in the classrooms. But the ones responsible to bring this story in the forefront, to be understood how important it was or Christianity would have come to an end as we know it today. Period. Let me just read to you quickly. The Battle of Tours, although not as earth-shattering as some Western historians have written it up to be, was nonetheless crucial in the development of Christian Europe. In a forest on the banks of Loire River, on the road between Tours and Portiers in France, two armies faced each other. It was October in the year 732 A.D. By the tenth day of the month, the future of Europe would be decided. Would be decided. Who were these armies? And why was this moment so important? Before we can, let's look at some history. We need to take a look at the events that led up to the battle. 110 years earlier, Muhammad had started the religion of Islam. After his death in 632, it spread throughout the Middle East. From their capital in Damascus, the caliphs spread their religion by the sword, conquering northern Africa, like I said, wiping out the Coptic church in the late 600s. In 713, the conquest of Spain was complete. No doubt the Europeans on the other side of the Pyrenees felt a little threatened. They were right to feel so. Thirsting for riches, glory, and new converts, the Muslims set raiding parties into France throughout 732. And in, the, in, in October of that year, an overwhelming force of Muslims crossed the Pyrenees and headed toward the French city of Tours, pillaging as they went. Christians say the Muslims had 400,000 horsemen. 
Muslim sources put the number at 60,000. The reason why they have done that because they don't want to, the world to see their defeat as such a grand victory for the Europeans because it was an overwhelming victory. But we'll get to that. According to the hist historian Edward Creasy, the Arab number diminishes. But that's just their side of the story. The Muslim armies were led by Abdir al-Rahman. He had become governor of Spain in 720 and it was reported to be the model of integrity and justice as well as an excellent general. The leader of the Franks and representative of Christianity against Islam could not have been more different. He was Charles, Charles Martel, an illegitimate son of Pepin, mayor of the palace. After a long and hard fight for succession, Charles put a puppet on the throne in 717 and assumed the mayor title of the palace. He spent most of the rest of his life conquering, conquering other kingdoms and putting down rebellions, preparing the way for his sons. While Charles, while Charles and the legitimate grandson of Pepin were fighting, Udo, Duke of Aquitaine, saw an opportunity to escape this to escape to the Franks and declare in the, escape from the Franks and declare independence. This displeased Charles, who after he won the throne in France, defeated Udo, but had to leave without finishing him off because of the Germanic aggressions in the northeast. In 721, Udo banished the ever-approaching Muslims from his kingdom, but in 725 they resurged and penetrated as far as Burgundy. Udo, unable to stop them, made peace by marrying his daughter to Otmar. How many times have you seen that through Old Testament history? A renegade Muslim who controlled an area of the northern Pyrenees. This act, act, this act angered both Charles and Abdir Rahman. In 731, Abdir Rahman killed Otmar in a battle and overran Aquitaine. Rahman decided to head further into France and to Tours. Udo escaped to Paris, where he met Charles, who was preparing an army to go after him. Udo begged for Charles' help in turning back the Muslims. Charles agreed, but only on the condition that Udo swear allegiance and never again break himself the rule of the Franks. Udo accepted and the Frankish army marched towards Tours as well. What happened next did not change the world. Listen to this. Listen closely. What happened next did not change the world, but it prevented the world from being changed. And why is it not taught in world history classes? Believe me, I took two of them. One in high school and one in college. Not once was this brought up. What happened next did not change the world, but it prevented the world from being changed. Abdir Rahman, nearing Tours, unexpectedly found Charles', Charles army. He had thought Charles be still in, to be still in the northwest. Abdir Rahman hoped that the Franks would take the offensive. An Arab account of the battle gives many excuses for the poor performance of the Arabs. Quote, what frightened him most of all was the possibility of losing his army among the forests and the streams. This is the general for the Arab army. It was barely cold weather with the Arabs still dressed for their summer campaigns. The wolf pelts of the Franks helped them in the icy cold. For seven days the two armies each waited for the other to, to attack. On the seventh day Abdir Rahman attacked. Quote, Charles held firm forming his men in a hollow square to take the main charge of the Arabs while dispatching raiders along unfrequent force pathways to attack the Arabs in the rear. The Arabs, once guerrillas, had reverted to a classical mode of warfare and were no match for the Franks, who outnumbered many more well-equipped soldiers than the Arab spies had indicated. Also, the Franks were fighting with the river at their back and could not retreat if they, had to, if they wanted to. The Arabs marching through France had acquired immense booty, and this was too worked in the favor of the Franks, who were not weighed down with the task of guarding the treasure, nor did they possess baggage trains of any kind. But let me tell you the geographical area. Charles Martel, smart individual, a smart leader, a smart leader in battle. <clears throat> it's almost like, not necessarily a fork, but a curvature, a geographical curvature that the river took that pinned Charles Martel army on one side of this river. 
and the river, here's the army, and the river surrounded from east to west in a roundabout way where the army just couldn't, out of fear, out of seeing the, the numbers of the Arabs' army, they were outnumbered, astronomically outnumbered, folks. It's unbelievable. Hundreds of thousands against a few. But Charles, he planted his army where escape was not an option. Fight or die. Just think about it. With that mentality, how much harder you're going to fight so you don't die. So that's the scenario of the geographical area. Fight or die. Escape's not an option. With that, let's move forward. The Arab accounts claim that the battle lasted two days, while according to Christian sources, the battle raged for seven. Now, doing all the history study on this, the Christian story that's been laid down also includes the waiting period. That's why they counted day one all the way through day seven as the total battle, because there's a lot of waiting between both armies to see who would attack first. But once the battle started, it was closer to a two-day battle and five days of waiting prior to that. So the Christian story is more accurate than the Arab side. The Arab account is likely closer to the truth, according to this historian. But what he fails to point out, he didn't count the five days of waiting. Let's continue. The Arab army was almost entirely form of cavalry. In previous battles, the side of the Arab Arabian cavalry charging had always put the enemy to flight. Thus, the Arabs had begun to regard their cavalry as invincible. In addition, they had many more soldiers in the Franks. But in a rare instance where medieval infantry stood up against cavalry charges, the disciplined Franks of soldiers withstood a determined charges. Though according to Arab sources, their cavalry several times broke into the interior of the Frankish square. Here's another quote. As the battle progressed, the Franks began to waver, according to the Arabs. Not in vain had Hisham, the caliph that ruled at the time, ordered his best metalsmiths to study the problems of armor. That's the Frankish armor. Behind their coats of mail, their pointed helmets, their horses clothed in chain mail, the Arabs were almost impregnable. I mean, that was the Frankish, uh, excuse me, metalsmith, looking on and perceiving and trying to find any weak points in the Arabs, not only army, but what they wore. They couldn't find any. They were on the verge of victory, and the Franks fought their way towards the treasure carts. All the booty they were carrying around with them as they were conquering one city and one town, one village after another. They didn't have time to go home and deposit it, so they just carried it along with, their, with them in their journey as they were conquering. A portion of the Arabs forgot the battle and ran to the defense of the carts. When the Frankish army got close to the booty, the Arab army decided it was more important to protect the booty than to win the battle. A portion of the Arabs forgot the battle and ran to the defense of the carts. Too many of the rest of the troops, this looked like a retreat. Arab troops, that is. Soon it was won. Abdir Rahman ordered his troops back into the line, but it, he was too late. A lance killed him. Then while the armies were still fighting, confusingly, night fell. Both armies returned to lick their wounds. Let's continue. It appears that the lieutenants of Abdir Rahman bickered among themselves about who would become the next leader. They could not decide peacefully, and in the night withdrew over the Pyrenees back into Spain. When Charles' army awoke that next morning, the tents of the Arabs were still in formation. Charles sent in spies when no Arabs were seen. He prepared his army for an ambush when it was reported that no Arabs were in the tents either. But when it became obvious that here, hit here to invincible, the Syrian cavalry had retreated, they did not trouble to pursue the fugitives, but contented themselves with sharing the spoils and returning rightly gladly to their own country. 
the casualties of the battle were at least 1,500 Christians and at the most 375,000 Arabs. 1,500 Christians, 375,000 Arabs. At first glance, it seemed that it was a remarkable bravery on the Franks in the face of the Muslim charge. Yet if we are to believe even some of the accounts of the Arabs, we will find that the Muslims were on the verge of victory. No, it was not the desperate act of a few Franks who made their way to the treasure carts of the Arabs and began taking them away. It was the greed of, small, of a small portion of the Arab army who, seeing their precious treasure being taken away, broke ran ranks and chased after it, leaving a greater treasure behind. It was the cowardice of the rest of the Arab army who normally braved when on the offensive mistaking the chase of the treasure for retreat. They saw some going back in retreat when that some was going back to protect the rest of the treasure that was not taken away at that point in that battle. And they construed that as a, uh, as a retreat. So they started retreating. And as they were retreating, they were being slaughtered. They withdrew from the fight and they quit quit fighting, and they start getting butchered. That's why the great numbers of loss of lives in this battle for the Arabs. It was the jealousy. And as they were retreating, chasing the treasure for retreat, we drew from the fight. It was one of the spears that found its mark in the heart of their leader, Abadir Rahman. It was the jealousy and lust for power of the lieutenants after he died that night of Abdir Rahman, who would not agree on one commander and returned to the fight, but instead, because they could not choose among themselves, withdrew over the Pyrenees, never to return again. The battle of the Tours was lost by the Arabs because of the common fallacies of man. What importance of this battle of the Tours? Of what importance of this battle of the Tours? That is the question. The most common response is that this was the high water mark of Islam in Europe. This turned the tide in the undeclared war against Western Europe. If the battle had not been won, the path would have been cleared for advance through Europe. As Edward Gibbon's famous line runs, a victorious line of march had been prolonged above a thousand miles from the Rock of Gibraltar to the banks of the Lures. The repetition of an equal space would have carried the Saracens to the confines of Poland and to the highlands of Scotland. The Rhine is more, not more impassable than the Nile or Euphrates, which the Arabs already did conquer, and the Arabian fleet might have sailed without a naval combat into the mouth of the Thames. Perhaps the interpretation of the Quran would now be taught in the schools of Oxford, and her pulpits might demonstrate to a circumcised people the sanctity and truth of the revelation of Muhammad. I already told you that's exactly what happened. Would have happened, and you and me today might be worshiping Allah instead of the Son of the Living God, the only begotten of Jesus Christ. A boundary was now clearly set between Christian and Muslim. This is an historian writing this. And not necessarily a Christian one, by the way. A boundary was now clearly set between Christian and Muslim. And aside from the Spaniards taking back their homeland, the Crusades and the fall of the Byzantine Empire, there will be no further conflict between the two. And as is so often mentioned in analysis of this battle, this ensured that Christianity, not Islam, would be the dominant religion in Europe and by the extension to the New World, where Ephraim would eventually wound up. All of Asian's plans of Europe were destroyed, along with much of the Arab army in this battle. Back to Revelation chapter 11, I mean chapter 13. So it's clear. Verse 3, And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death. Back to Revelation 17. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. From the beginning of Islam, created by Muslim, to 732 was a short space, folks. And that is the space that's referred to in the book of Revelation. This is the head that was slain, it would be healed after World War II, but it was slain in 732. If it wasn't, 
the advancement of Islamic belief systems would have taken place, the world, for most part, as we know it today, would be Islamic. Christianity would be dead. It would have died. You'd be worshiping Allah, a false god today. I would be worshiping a false god today. But it, as scriptures declared, it came, but it only continued that short space. After this battle, after this battle, Charles would turn to, to Paris and continue to go in the Franks and fight battles. Upon his death in 741, a little more than nine years since his famous battle, his sons, not content with the title mayor of the palace, assumed the kingship and divided the kings among themselves. The son of one of them is forever etched into the history of Europe. The son of one of them is forever etched in the history of Europe, just as his grandfather is. He ushered in a new chapter in the history of Europe. His name was Charles as well. But he is often called Charles the Great. In Latin, he is called Charlemagne. And that's a whole other story for a whole other series. Let there be no confusion, folks. We now understand what Daniel 9, not Daniel 9, Daniel 12, verse 11 and 12, dates to, without a doubt. Without a doubt. You take the 1,335 days from the point where the sacrifice is no longer happening daily, march that time period all the way forward into history using the prophetic calendar conversion that you have to use because it's both part of Old and New Testament history, you get to 732 A.D. You can't deny that. You can't erase it. It's there. It's always been there. It hasn't changed. God's word hasn't changed. These beasts hasn't changed. The events of history hasn't changed. It just demonstrates God's faithfulness of telling us the truth. That's why I say Hebrews chapter 12 or chapter 11 Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things not seen. We have seen most things. We're the generation that doesn't have any excuse not to have faith. There's so much evidence that we could look back to to see God's faithfulness. But yet, the world in greater numbers than ever is lost. Christians, shamefully, don't have a clue why they should be excited and full of desire and passion to let the rest of this world know the time is running out. The fulfillment of all things is at the door. You're going to be involved in a lot of things in your life, but nothing should re replace the passion that Christ has commanded us for, to, to live, to carry out. And that is our love for one another. And there is no greater expression of that. No greater expression of anyone's love than providing the word of God to them that's rightly divided, that brings life, not eternal damnation. I need to shake up some of you back into the reality. All the other things that you do in life are nothing. Nothing. Everything that you accomplish is nothing compared to the Great Commission. Listen, I worked for the ministry for years. Then I went in the secular world and I established what I have today. But that means nothing. Nothing. I made full circle and I came. I mean, kept my promises. I stayed where I was for 30 some years. When the time came, I came back to it realizing there's nothing that can replace that. And just because you're not a minister doesn't mean you cannot have the same attitude. You're without excuse. 
You're too worried about becoming super spiritual with super spiritual nonsense and not recognizing what God has called you to do. To provide the word of God in the capacity you were called to provide that. To do what? It's clear in the New Testament to go make disciples. All the evidence is there that we are approaching the end of time. Time is such an important commodity in this time period because every second that ticks away, every second that ticks away is one second less we have to bring the truth to a lost world. You need to shake yourselves up. You need to do all you can do to get it done. Play the song.